Hey guys, good morning. We're going to finish up Romans chapter 10 today. This is really short, really simple, especially compared to looking at chapter 9. This chapter is way more straightforward. I hope that you can see that. I do ask that you follow along with me and uh, let's, let's work on these questions. All right, so today we're looking at chapter 10 and we'll be looking at 14 through 21. All right, first of all, let's real quickly review what we looked at yesterday. And yesterday, we saw that Israel is rejecting God, and Paul is demonstrating through history that God's righteousness was received always and only by faith. So we saw that Israel had tried to... to become righteous before God on their own hard work and efforts in obeying the law. They were not knowledgeable. I'll be careful with that. I'll, I'll explain that, what I mean by knowledgeable in these upcoming verses, but they were not knowledgeable, so to speak, of their the way to actually obtain righteousness. And really the issue with them, the Jews, was really an attitude that they had. They were taught correctly, but they refused to listen to the scriptures, if that makes sense. So they had an attitude that was behind their passion, their zeal, to gain righteousness. Their wrong attitude was, I can do it myself. So all they did was try to obtain righteousness on their own efforts rather than realizing that they fall short. And only Christ is the one who can truly obey the law and... We need to put our faith in him. So the purpose of the law was to make us, make the Jews, make you and me realize that the law is completely out of our grasp. I cannot obey the law. I cannot obey my parents. I cannot always tell the truth. I cannot be faithful. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot obey the law the way God commands. And that is to put us in a place where we look to Christ who does it for us. Remember, the gospel is never about what we can do. It's rather about what has already been done for us. And, and, and so it points the finger to the, comp the perfect work and the completed work of Christ. All right, so we've also looked at how um, what a person must do to be saved. And we said, since he's not saved by obeying the law, and only Christ could do that, it says that we need to, only way for us to be saved is to declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and will be saved. And then Paul went on to say, it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth you profess your faith and are saved. And so we spoke yesterday about what the heart meant. And the heart means four things. It is the, the place of our emotions and affections, our intellect and will. Now, if you think about it, what we mean by the heart of a person is clearly not the organ that pumps blood, but rather the, the core of what makes you, you. What makes you, you are your emotions, affections, your intellect and your will. That, that, that's what makes us who we are. So in Jewish culture, in the Hebrew culture, um, believing in our heart meant that we loved God and trusted God and believed in God with our intellect, how we think, and with our will, how we behave, and how we and what we love and our emotions. And so and so serving God, believing in God incorporated every part of who I am. That's why we said in number five that, that why both believing and confessing uh, with our mouth is so important, believing with our heart and confessing with our mouth, because it shows the relationship between faith and our works. And so in, in, in the idea that some people might say, well, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm saved by faith. Well, in Hebrew culture, they would laugh at you. They'd say that that's, that that's a dumb thing you just said because what I do really reflects what I believe. Don't divorce those two things. Don't separate them. 
but rather in Hebrew culture, they would put them and say them synonymously. So if I said one thing and acted another way, I'm a liar. I say, I love you. But if I don't act in love towards you, I don't act lovingly toward you, then they'd say, well, you're a liar. Um, so, so let us be mindful that what we profess with our mouth and what we and how we behave needs to be um, in in harmony with one another. They need to be in sync. All right. So let's pick up with question six, since that's where we left off yesterday. Um, it says here, why Israel does not call on the Lord? All right. We already know that they uh, need to call on the Lord, but they chose to obtain righteousness by works. But then let's move on here and say why Israel actually doesn't call on the Lord. So look at question six. It says, despite chapter 10, six through eight, someone might still argue that God did not give the Jews sufficient opportunity to respond to the gospel. Well, in those verses, um, I know that's the weird part about ascending into the deep and blah, blah, blah. Um, really, those verses are highlighting what I already had you guys write down yesterday, and that is that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and um, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. It's believing the gospel. But it says here, someone might argue that God did not give the Jews sufficient opportunity to respond to the gospel. But he says here in verses 10, in chapter 10, 14 and 15, Paul asks four rhetorical questions to show the conditions necessary to call on the Lord and be saved. What are these four conditions? Well, let's look at them right in front of us. It says, Paul writes, how then can they call on the one they've not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent. Well, let's look at these four questions in reverse order. First of all, verse 15, how can anyone preach unless they're sent? God sends people. So if God is saving people all over the globe, God is saving people from every tongue and tribe, what is God going to do? Well, he's going to send people to preach to them. Think about when you became a Christian. Did your mom tell you about Jesus? Your grandparent, your dad, a sibling, a pastor, youth pastor, someone told you about Christ. And before, in order for them to tell you, it means they were sent by God. It might not seem like they were sent. It's just my mom. She was just sitting there at the table and she talked about Jesus. Or I'm, I went to youth group. I went to church. No one was sent. They just, they, they were just there all the time. And they told me, well, that's what it means to be sent. God puts people in places to speak to others about his gospel, and God sends them. So first of all, the first question here in verse 15 is, how can anyone preach unless they're sent? So God sends people. Now look at the, 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 the second question. It says, how can they hear without something preaching to them. So the first thing is God sends people. The second thing is those people that are sent preach. They teach. They articulate the gospel. They talk about the work of Christ. They talk about the atoning death, his righteousness uh, through his perfect obedience to the law, etc., etc., etc. So God sends people. Those people go and preach. Now look at the third uh, um, I'm going backwards here, obviously. I haven't figured it out here. I'm out, and in the middle of verse 14, he says, And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? So God sends people. Those people preach. And now the person has to hear. They have to hear the message. All right? And now the fourth condition, verse 14, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in. So notice, God sends. Those people sent preach or teach. Then they speak to someone or groups of people, and they have to hear. And then the person, the individual, who is hearing has to believe. Well, let me ask you this. In Israel, did God ever send people 
to teach the gospel to the Israelites, to the Jews. Who might God have sent to Israel? Could you name one person? Could you name two? Who are those whom God sent to the nation of Israel throughout all history? I'll give you a hint. It begins with a P. It's the words, it's the word prophet. God sent the prophets to teach God's word. Now, did the prophets who were sent, did they actually preach the gospel? Well, if you're not sure, go read Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. You get the idea, right? There's, there's a lot of prophets, you know, like Elijah and Elisha and Nathan, and the list goes on and on and on. He sent so many prophets over the course of history. You have the 12 minor prophets. They're called minor because they're short books, not because they're less than. And of course, you have the four major prophets. They're not greater than, they're just longer books. So you have the major minor prophets and then a whole host of other prophets in there as well, which I would say Moses is one and Abraham is one and blah, blah, blah. So God sent prophets. They actually preached. We know those people preached. And... Um, as, a, as, as an example, a really fun example, actually, uh, you guys remember with Elijah, who went up on the mountain, Mount Carmel, to have this contest between God and Baal. May the, you know, they let the, they would each made an altar, the prophets of Baal and, the, and, and Elijah made a prophet to God. Uh, and, and they said the, they would call on God, their God to see which one would light the altar on fire, right? I mean, he was preaching. He was saying, believe in God, who's the true God. So, so, so they were sent they preached. Now here's a question. Did the Israelites hear the message? Well, I think we know the answer to that question. Here's my question. What is the natural way for a man to respond to God's commands? What do we do? We naturally what? Disobey. Well, what did Israel do to all the prophets? They killed them. How do I know that the Israelites heard clearly the prophets? It's because they killed them. Because if they heard them wrongly and they heard a false gospel, they would have been like, hey, this is cool. Remember, the natural inclination of the human heart is to reject God. And so they rejected the messenger as well as the message. In fact, they didn't believe the prophets so what did God do? He sent his own son. Surely they're going to believe my son if they don't believe my servants. And what did they do to the son? They killed him too. So I know that they heard the message. So God sent prophets, the prophets preached, and the Israelites heard the message. So verse 14 tells us, gives us a real clue here. It tells us, so what was the issue? It says, how can they call the one they have not believed in? So let's go to question number six. And it says here to write down the four rhetorical questions. So write those down. How, you, so you can write them down. You can do it in either order. I like looking at these personally backwards order because I think it makes more sense backwards than it does to go from 14 through 15. I like it the other way around. But you can write down however you want. So it's how can they preach unless they're sent? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And then how can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? So write down those four questions there for number six. Let's look at number seven, which we've already answered. It says, which condition of salvation was not met in the case of most Israelites? Well, verse 14 is kind of giving us a clue, but let's check out this verse. Let's look at verse 16. It says here, Paul writes, he says, but not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So he's asking the question, who believed our message? Because most of the Israelites did not. Now, some did. And verse 16 alludes to that. But not all the Israelites accepted. But some did. And, and we can name some. Paul the Apostle was one. He was an Israelite, right? He was born from the tribe of Benjamin. And he was a full-blood Jew, child of Abraham, 
and he came to Christ. So, so not all the Israelites accepted the good news, but certainly some did. So that's telling us, Lord, who has believed our message? Because Isaiah is saying to God, most people are not. Okay, so that's question number seven. What condition of salvation was not met? They didn't believe, but the other three conditions were. Oh, you know what? I forgot to say one thing here. Look at the end of verse 15. It says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Think about it. So if God sends someone, they show up, they preach, people hear, and then they get saved. They say, man, your feet are beautiful. They're not beautiful because of what they look like, not because their toes are painted just nice, just right, and they're filed down and, and the feet are perfect. No, 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 no. These feet are beautiful because of the message that they brought. So I got to tell you this story. It's actually a true story. There was this uh, tribe in in the African jungle that was pretty pretty uh, pretty far in and, and hard to get to. You had to travel miles on foot. And this this guy um, knew about these people, and um, he lived in a different tribe, and and he got saved by a missionary. And when he heard the news, he wanted to go and tell this tribe so he runs into the woods long way his feet get bloody and battered and, and messed up and when he gets there he tells them about christ and some of them become saved and his feet were disgusting and his feet were bloody and ripped and and had cuts on them and and just really ugly and muddy and and those would be beautiful feet anyway thought i'd share that with you all right let's move on so question number Eight. It says, why can't the Jews blame their unbelief on the fact they can't understand the word of Christ? Well, let's, let, let, let's continue with our passage here. Look at verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from the hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. All right. So look at verse 14. How can I grow in my faith? If I've never heard the message of Christ, well, I can't. How can I grow in my faith if I never read the Bible? I don't know if I can. How can I grow in my faith if I never meditate on the truth of Scripture? Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. He's talking about Scripture. So if I'm a person who's never heard the Scripture, how could I be saved? I'll never know the truth that Christ died for my sins. I'll never know God raised him from the dead. So I can't get saved. I have to know the message. But think about your, you and your own personal life. You've heard this message before, but how often do you read the Bible? How often do you study the scripture? If you never look at it, you don't go to church, how can you possibly grow? Just think about that. So I encourage you to read the scripture and meditate on it. Because only in doing so does our faith grow. And uh, then he says in verse 18, he says, But I ask, did they not hear? And of course, I've already told you that it says, of course, they did. Well, I told you that because I gave you evidence that they did because they killed the prophets. Although it doesn't say that in this Romans passage, we know that from all the entire Old Testament, as well as Jesus made that claim, and they killed, they killed Jesus. They killed Jesus. But I asked, did they not hear? Of course they did. And look how it's written here. It says, their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation, I'll make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. All right, what's he saying here? Did Israel not understand? He doesn't answer the question yes or no. But he's giving us an implied answer by the following verses. First of all, understand this. Verse 19 when it says, I'll make you envious by those who are not a nation, and then verse 20, which I didn't read yet, both 19 and 20 have to do with the Gentiles. Verse 21 has to do with the Jews. Did Israel not understand? 
First, Moses says, look at verse 19, I'll make you Jews envious. I'll make you Jews jealous by those who are not a nation. He's saying, I'll make you Jews jealous or envious by a bunch of Gentiles who are scattered abroad. Gentiles from all over other nations. Then he says, I'll make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. I will make you Jews angry by a group of people, by Gentiles, that never had the scripture and therefore never understood. Why? Because God's going to reveal himself to those people through prophets. Isn't that what, what the Old Testament was supposed to do? Remember um, uh, Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh? They're Gentiles. He didn't want to go. Israel was terrible. But they were supposed to go, and he did go, and guess what happened to Nineveh? They repented. Uh, remember he was up on the hill waiting for God to destroy them, and God never did. It's because they repented. Um, and so it makes the Jews jealous and angry because they're pursuing something and not getting it while Gentiles did. Why? Because the Gentiles heard the message from the prophets that God sent out, and they came to faith, whereas the Jews are refusing to put their faith in God, refusing to trust him, and rather are trying to establish their own righteousness, which they fail miserably. So that's verse 19. Now look at verse 20. Isaiah says boldly, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. Again, Gentiles. God saying, I was found by those who did not seek me. Who was that? Well, the Gentiles didn't seek God. Okay? I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. So God says, I revealed myself to Gentiles who weren't asking about God. So go back to Abraham. Abraham was told in Genesis 12 that he would become the father of a great nation. And further it says in the beginning of 12 that all peoples on earth will be blessed through him. All nations will be blessed through him. So all Gentiles... So it was always God's plan to save Jew and Gentile. But God's doing something really interesting here that we're going to see really particularly in chapter 11. But we're seeing the, the seeds of it right here. And that is, is that God wanted to save Israel, but Israel refused. God wanted to save Gentiles. And the way God originally told the Jews to do it was they were to be salt and light into the world. So the God's instrument of saving the world was the Jews. But the Jews did a really bad job. They didn't go out and teach the Gentiles. They didn't want anything to do with the Gentiles. So what God then did is he said, I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm going to save them to make you jealous so that you see what my blessing is. And so you get jealous so that you come to faith. He's trying to save both Jew and Gentile. He'll talk more about that, particularly in chapter 11. Now, so 19 and 20 are talking about the Gentiles. Now look at verse 21. But concerning Israel, clearly the Jews, he says, all day long I held up my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. So think about that image. Imagine a dad standing there all day long holding his hands out to a child saying, come to me, I will heal you. Come to me, I will help you. Come to me, I will fix the problem. And the boy stands there with his head turned looking the other direction with his arms crossed, and he's going, hmm, like he's pouting. I don't want your help. I do it myself. See, God is pleading, so to speak, with the Israelites, saying, I'm going to take care of you, but they're refusing to put their faith in him. So God says, all day long I held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Now here's some extra credit points for today. Two extra credit points if you can tell me what the word obstinate means. You know what disobedient means? It doesn't follow the rules of the law. But obstinate means hard-hearted. Sounds like Pharaoh. Obstinate people. So where are you going to write this down? I tell you what. Write down the word obstinate and write down hard-hearted. Okay? Put that down next to number, right above number eight at the top of the paper if you want two extra points. All right, so question number eight. Why can't the Jews blame their unbelief on the fact they can't understand the word of Christ? Well, first of all, it says that God is holding out his hands, so to speak, waiting for them to come. 
They can't blame their unbelief on the fact they couldn't understand the word of Christ because the word of Christ was taught to them and it was taught to them clearly. All right, that's what we see here in these previous verses. Okay, right there in verse 18, their voice gone, gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. So the Jews can't blame uh, their unbelief when they couldn't understand the word of Christ because it was given to them and given to them clearly. And my, I'm saying this, doesn't say it here in this passage, but the proof of that is they killed the prophets. Let's look at question number nine. What can 9.30 through 10.21 tell us about? Well, let's look at these series of questions here. What does God do to lead someone to salvation? Think about what I just talked about. Look at the passage of Scripture. You might need to open your Bible or so. But what does God do to lead someone to salvation? Well, what's the first thing we said? What was those rhetorical questions? First thing is God sends out his word so that people can learn the way of salvation. God sends people to teach others about Christ so they can be saved. Look, the second part of question number nine. Our responsibility for other people's salvation. What is my responsibility? What is your responsibility? Our responsibility is to teach others, to tell others, to witness to others, to preach to others the message of the gospel. That message needs to be given to others. It's our job to do it. We are God's hands and feet, or in this case, his mouthpiece to teach the truth of the gospel to others. Now, what must a person do himself to be saved? Well, a person has to do two things. A person has to, first of all, listen to the message. We have to listen to the message. Then we must confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead. That's what it says here. Okay, so we've got to do the, both these. We've got to listen, then we need to believe and confess. All right, what actions and attitudes, okay, the next, the last part here underneath number nine, what actions and attitudes keep a person from salvation? Well, in verse 21, I see two things written down right there, don't you? It is, well, plain old disobedience. Well, with Pharaoh, it was obstinate. It was hard-heartedness. What about ignorance? I, don't, I, I won't listen to the gospel, so I'm, I'm ignorant of the gospel. What about me learning of the way of salvation, but I choose to do it on my own, so I have pride in my heart or arrogance? That's a lot. A lot going on there. All right, write those things down. Ignorance and pride and arrogance and disobedience and hard-heartedness, abstinence. Abstinence. Obstinance, not abstinence. Ha. Okay, number 10. Summarize, really, chapter 930 through 1021 as clearly as possible. I want you guys to write down your own summary for number 10. I look forward to reading it on, um, when you guys turn it in, and you guys... Uh, do that for me, please. Summarize it in your own words. You do not have homework assignment 13 to do. At the top of the page, whatever it is, I think it's above question number 8 is probably what you'll have. But look at the top there, and if you put down the word obstinate and define it as hard-heartedness, I'll give you guys two extra points. This concludes chapter 10. Um, we're going to be having our test this week, and I'm going to have that posted on teams and on the class page as to a little direction about that um, when we'll do that and uh, look forward to that um, in the next day or so so um, anyway hope you guys are doing great if you have any questions hit me up on teams you guys have a great day